In today's viewer suggested episode of Mike's Hard Reviews, we're going to take a look at a very particular Italian Amaro that can be kind of divisive in large circles, but around the world is enjoyed by many, many an imbiber. What exactly is Fernet Branca on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews? Hey there, hi there, ho there, my name is Michael, I'm a bartender and mixologist from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and today I'm wearing scrubs, which will come into play later, but I can assure you is immaterial of most everything. <laughs> I just came from work, and I'm tired. But it also ties into what is happening in my universe right now, so we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. No, in fact, today we are going to take a dive into the world of Italian Amaro and discuss a particular one known as Fernet Branca at the suggestion of viewer Al Roth, who in a previous video commented he wanted to hear what my personal take on Fernet was and see me use it in a couple of different creations, both of my own and one of the most popular cocktails to be made with Fernet Branca. That all being said, let's take a quick step back and do a primer on what exactly an Amaro is. Broadly speaking, Amaro, or Amari technically, are actually a wide class of Italian liqueurs flavored with herbs and spices, usually made with grape spirit bases like grappa, which is a form of brandy made from grapes. There are a couple different examples of uh, these Amari you might have heard of. There's Amaro no Nino, which you can find in the Paper Plane, uh, Averna, which appears in the Black Manhattan, uh, Ramazzotti, which we've seen previously on this show, actually, uh, in my cocktail, the Radio Free Cuba, and Fernet Branca. These all represent different classes of Amari, actually. There are different styles of Amari that all fall under that sort of botanical Italian liqueur arch. One of these, actually, is known as a Fernet, which in particular are flavored with things like myrrh, chamomile, Chinese rhubarb, and most importantly, saffron as its distinguishing flavor. These things have been around for forever, and in fact, Fernet Braga has been around for almost 200 years. So let's take a dive into the history of Fernet Branca and tell you a little bit about the bottle specifically. Here I have a bottle of Fernet Branca, which was sourced from Tiffany's Wine and Spirits here in Kalamazoo. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them, but I'm gonna shout them out once again. I absolutely love the guys over at Tiffany's Wine and Spirits. They're really knowledgeable people and they keep a lot of really cool stuff on their shelves. So if you have the option to, a loud car. If you have the option to, go check them out. They've got a lot of really great selection and right now they're running a lot of really good clearance deals on some bottles they're trying to move out of the store. So give them a look-see. Back to Fernet Branca, which began its production in the city of Milan in Italy in 1845. Now, Fernet Branca was initially uh, formulated by a self-taught herbalist. You're seeing the scrubs come into play here a little bit. <laughs> a self-taught herbalist by the name of Bernardino Branca, who began the production in 1845 and alongside his sons constructed the company to manufacture and sell it. Now, uh, quick aside, an herbalist is a sort of naturopathic pharmacist dealing in herbs and spices as remedies for uh, various ailments. I am a pharmacy technician, so I'm actually a medical professional. Herbalists, not so much. <laughs> His creation of this as a treatment for various ailments like worms and menstrual pain meant that this was actually sold as a medicinal remedy, a pick-me-up and a cure-all for a couple different afflictions that were, I suppose, common at the time. Kind of like a lot of other botanical liqueurs uh, and even Angostura bitters, uh, they were sold as medicinal products, which comes into play in its popularity here in America in a little bit. A Fernet Branca was initially popular and continued to be produced from 1845 up until now under its original recipe. In 1907, a distillery was established in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and in 1936, following the repeal of Prohibition in order to meet American demand, uh, one was set up in Tribeca, New York. Here in America, this was made popular by the fact that it was sold as a medicinal remedy for various things. So even though alcohol was banned in the country during the late 1900s, early 1920s, uh, you could yes, actually still get this at pharmacies and places. And that was how you got your alcohol fix. In Argentina, however, it became popular because at the time, a lot of Italians were simply emigrating to Argentina. And since then, even though the population has shifted back towards you know, not being so Italian, Fernet Branca has stayed as a mainstay of their preferred class of spirits to enjoy. Nowadays, Argentina accounts for 75% by some estimates of the total consumption of Fernet Branca worldwide. Other estimates point to a slightly lower number because 35% of it roughly comes from San Francisco alone. And that I don't have an explanation for necessarily. <laughs> Maybe there's a lot of cool bars who use Fernet Branca out in San Francisco. Maybe that's it, but I don't know. I, I, either way, it's popular in both places and has been a mainstay not just as a neat sipping spirit, 
as a digestif post meals, but also as a member of the cocktail modifier's fervament, or pantheon, I suppose. Brennerbrock is often referred to as the bartender's handshake, a sort of unique and very characterful spirit that can be used to bring a lot of class to cocktails that are missing a little bit of extra oomph. Now, I have never had Fernet Branca, so I'm going to be trying it for the first time today. And to start this off, uh, I'm going to go ahead and actually try it neat. Let's go ahead and crack this new one open. I'm just gonna give this a sip out of, uh, not a sip, but a, a, a sniff out of the bottle. Oh, that's actually not what I was expecting. That's really fascinating. Okay, let's go ahead and um, pour ourselves a slug of Fernet. Like I said, I've never had Fernet Branca before, so literally anything is on the table here. It being a botanical liqueur and in the Amaro family, uh, which I am relatively familiar with, I'm a big fan of Amaro Nino and Ramazzotti in particular, um, I had kind of an idea of what to expect here, but I think based on what I'm getting just out of this bottle, um, I, I, might, I might be in for a slightly different expectation than I was thinking. I grab a Glen Cairn here and just pour myself a little gentle pour of Fernet. Fernet coming in at 39% alcohol means that it's going to be a lot less viscous, a lot less sweet than uh, other liqueurs in the Amaro family, like Ramazzotti, for example, uh, or even Amaro Nino, actually, which I think is still relatively high proof, but very, very sweet. So sipping a neat like this is going to give us kind of a very pungent, raw flavor. Let's go ahead and um, start by giving it a, a proper smell. That's actually really surprisingly gentle. I was anticipating it to be a lot more intense. I'm getting notes mostly of mint, actually. There's a very, very noticeable mint impact here. Maybe cinnamon, nutmeg, um, a little bit of clove, a sort of in, a, a, a suggestion of baking spice, but not necessarily any particular baking spice. It reads almost, almost like it has the character of a brandy, actually, um, which I would not be surprised if it did. I do believe that Fernet specifically is made with um, grape brandy as its base. I think that is definitely playing a role here, and I actually am enjoying the smell of it quite a lot. Let's go ahead and give our Fernet a sip. Ooh. Oh, that's, whoa. <clears throat> wow, that's intense. I'm getting a really strong impact here from, from the mint. The mint is definitely showing up on the palate the same way it does on the nose, but what I'm not getting on the nose that is showing up on my palate is this very dark, rich, very rooty, herbal bitterness. Um, and I can't quite place the flavors because I'm not super used to the botanicals uh, that are used in the production of Fernets and Fernet Braca as well. I do get the myrrh. Knowing what myrrh smells like, I do get the actual taste of it in here as well. Rhubarb I'm less familiar with. I think I see the kind of fruity characteristic that would carry. Uh, but in all honesty, it actually has a very reminiscent profile to rum in a lot of ways. This is a kind of funky esteriness that I find in Jamaican rums that's present here as well. And I don't know if that's because of the still that they're using. Maybe it's similar to, um, I think I think coffee stills are what's used to make Jamaican rum. They, maybe that's providing that kind of character to the spirit, but wherever it's coming from, it's really enjoyable. <laughs> Opens on mint. It's kind of a peppercorn, kind of peppercorny, you know, pokiness to it. Immediately after that on the mid palate, the mint is ringing really strong on the front, the front palate. Back palate, dark, rich, deep roots, maybe maybe coffee, coffee-like, almost um, almost rooty. Not like in the way Ramazzotti is, where it has a very obvious cola root influence, but more like, um, like gentian, like gentian root, uh, which actually wouldn't be surprised if, if it did appear in here. Very, very good. Relatively sweet, but not, but not so sweet that it's kind of trouncing apart, trampling the, the flavors of the botanicals. It is it is very potent. It's, it's, this is, this is really good. This is really, really good. I like this a lot. I can honestly see myself spiking some eggnog with this, this, uh, this coming Christmas and enjoying that a lot because the sort of botanical complexity that I'm seeing here is complemented by a very natural baking spice presence and adding that to eggnog, which kind of already has like cinnamon, nutmeg, clove going on would just be so, so good for net nog. I, Fernet Nog. Guys, Fernet Nog. Oh my god, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> but I'll off, I will be happy to say that Fernet on its own, I'm actually vibing with really hardcore. Every sip is, is, is like equally intense too. It doesn't, it's not like other Amari where you get kind of used to it. There, there's this sort of like rotating list of botanicals where not every single one appears at the same time. And it's, it's really fascinating. So immediately right off the bat, thank you for suggesting this because I think I have found uh, not just a new favorite modifier, but a new favorite, a new favorite sipping spirit, actually. Uh, 
I'm, 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 I'm very excited to start working with this in my private time. This is gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> now, while Fernet Branca is actually enjoyed exactly this way, sort of neat uh, as a sipping spirit, or maybe even on the rocks as if it were like a slug of uh, scotch or whiskey, it is actually also used in a lot of cocktails. And in fact, there's a very, 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 very popular uh, cocktail out of Argentina that is the most popular way it is consumed, especially in Argentina. So. Let's go ahead and take a look at the sort of Fernet cocktail firmament uh, as a whole and pick a couple out of what they can, what, what it can be used for to experiment with just a little bit. Allow me to move my, my tea out of the way uh, so we can discuss the Fernet cocktail world. So Fernet Branca does actually have three cocktails listed on their website, and a lot of them actually lean very heavily into the Italian influence of this spirit. One of them involves, uh, I think it's called uh, Cinotto, uh, which is like an orange soda um, native to Italy. I don't think you can get it here in the States. There's another one uh, that has like Antica, Ver Antica Carpano Vermouth, which is like a very like nice vermouth. It's a really like heavy pour of it too. So it's definitely leaning into the sort of the herbal context of the Fernet. Then the last one they had is called the Fernet Cub Number One, which I was planning on making. It's just a Fernet Bronco Mule. And having tasted this, yeah, sure, that would work just fine, but that's boring. So let's try something a little bit more in tune with what uh, Fernet should be used for, at least in my opinion. I mentioned that there's a very, 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 very popular cocktail by the name of a Fernando uh, that comes out of Argentina, or more commonly it's known as a Fernet con Coca, uh, meaning a Fernet and Coke, as in Coca-Cola. Embracing the character of a bitter aperitif uh, alongside a sort of sweetening, lengthening, uh, equally complex and similar in profile base spirit, because cola is a root, so root, spices, and botanicals, it all, it all fits together very well. So we're gonna go ahead and start by making a Fernet con Coca. This is actually a cocktail you can make in the glass, so we're gonna grab a uh, highball here. And we'll start by grabbing our Fernet Branca and pouring in two ounces. The spec for a Fernet and Coke is a debated thing. How much uh, Fernet to Coke are you doing? Is it 50-50? Is it 10% 10, 10 90? Is it, is it, you know, the traditional two to four? There's a lot of places you can go with it. And you can kind of tune it to your preference uh, for Fernet itself by simply adding more Coke or more Fernet, based on what you prefer more. I'm gonna grab a can of Coke out of our refrigerator here, and I'm gonna start the effervescence in the bottom here by just throwing a little bit in. We're gonna come behind that and add our ice so that we can top it up uh, to the correct wash line. Once we got that ice up, we will come behind and just top up with our Coke. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a Fernet con Coca. I hope I'm pronouncing the inflection on the coca part right. <laughs> so I think what's really great about this liqueur is that this actually appears in other images of the spirit in this preparation where it does foam up really, really nicely. And that just got such a nice, clean, kind of beer-like aesthetic to it, which I can I can get behind. Let's go ahead and give our uh, Fernet Con Coca or a Fernando a sip. Cheers. Definitely a cocktail that prefers a straw, but even without the ease of that, oh man. Is that really, really good? <laughs> the sweetness of the Coca-Cola is really what's carrying this here, I think. There's a lot of it in there. It's, I mean, Fernet is still a liqueur, it is a sweetened product, but the bitterness of its botanicals when it's by itself does really shine through. The Coke lengthening out that Fernet kind of cuts back on that bitterness, but allows a lot of that flavor to still be present, especially the mint and like this kind of baking spice, clovey, myrrh flavor that's in there. And the two combine in that sort of joint space of this is flavored like roots uh, very, very well. And it's it's just so three-dimensional and bright, surprisingly. Despite how kind of dark and sweet Coke can be, it's really just been given this whole new direction and it's really, really nice. You know, I'm starting to read this the, the influence of the Fernet here differently on every sip. And it really is really great, but kind of like how uh, Jamaican rum tastes like rotting bananas, like the kind of funkiness of rotting bananas, this tastes kind of like the dry rot uh, of an old bookstore. I mean that entirely positively. I mean that entirely positively. It tastes awesome, and it has that kind of nostalgic note to it, too, that sort of adds to it, um, which, you know, is just, it's, it's really, really nice. <laughs> 
I've always said that one of my favorite things about this this thing that I do is getting to experience new stuff like this. This is a combination that I don't think you'd find anywhere else. No, no other Amaro is going to create this exact thing. Frenette really is that unique. I'm already in love with it. This is really impressive. Do I think a lot of Americans could get behind something like this? Probably not. Um, and do I think it could use some acidity? Maybe a little bit. Um, I, I did see online that some places do call for a garnish of like lemon peel or like a little bit of citrus just to kind of bring it back a little bit. But I, I like this the way it is, honestly. It's honest. And in a long form like this, as opposed to like over like in a short rocks glass over ice, it's it's just the right the right balance of sweet and herbal and bitter and complex and simple and cold and carbonated that I I absolutely love. <laughs> so uh, Al Roth also suggested that I make this in a cocktail of my own. And initially I thought about oh okay I'm going to try a macadamia mai tai with a very particular kind of sweet rum that I recently bought. Uh, the Fernet and then my macadamia nut Rougeau from the Chi Chi, the Mac and Chi episode actually, um, that I still have some of. But I'm actually going to do something a little bit more interesting that I, because now that I've tasted it, I think it's going to work really, really well. I'm going to show you guys a cocktail that I have not completed yet. This is a work in progress called a Stalwart Detective. To start, we have to grab a cocktail shaker. And into that shaker, we're going to pour one part of a good high proof bourbon. We'll come behind that with one part of a cold brew concentrate. And finally, we need one part of a blend of liqueurs. In particular, actually, this is going to be an Amaro, a coffee liqueur, and uh, of all things, creme de violet, which is now the time that I'm going to use to explain this real quick. The uh, Star Wars Detective is meant to be a sort of Lovecraftian-inspired uh, cocktail, meant to be indicative of a grizzled alcoholic veteran detective who hates the world and uh, is kind of eccentric and uh, boozy and a little bit hard to swallow. So this is the kind of Lovecraftian spooky potion ingredient and the Amaro is the sort of grizzled hard on crime detective. So we're gonna take each of our liqueurs and each one of them is going to get a one third part measure in the cocktail. So I'll just measure all those out. Add those right to our shaker. We'll go ahead and uh, grab some ice real quick. And as always, we're gonna do one cube whole and one cube cracked. Cap that up and tap it down. Shake for 10 to 12 seconds to chill and combine. I knew it was gonna happen eventually. I was kind of excited for it, honestly. Wow. I've been noticing in editing that this shaker doesn't seat very well, so I knew that was gonna happen eventually, but anyway, chill and combine. We're gonna grab a piece of very casual, or if you have it, you know, some very, very fancy, weird shaped stemware. We'll pour in our cocktail. Like I said, it's a work in progress, so there's actually no garnish, and this is technically the wrong proportions, but that is more or less a work in progress stalwart detective. Okay, I've cleaned up everything but the floor. I'm gonna try to make this quick so I can get that cleaned up too. Uh, but let's go ahead and give our stalwart detective a sip. Cheers. Oh man. Oh man, I might have found the solution to this cocktail. Holy shit. <laughs> it's a little sweet. Um, I think my cold brew concentrate is probably not quite uh, as strong as it normally is. Uh, but that being said, uh, that is is coffee and, and sweet floral bitter rooty notes that are playing together so well. The hard part with this cocktail was that I could not find a way to merge the flavor of coffee and violet together. It was so, so difficult. But what the Fernet has done here is actually take that and make it possible by including these very particular rooty, and I guess in some contexts it's even because there's a really strong mint uh, impact there, floral bitterness, and allow the two to be brought together really strongly. There's like a perfect bridge being built there between the bitter, uh, sort of rooty beaniness of coffee and the uh, sort of lighter bitterness of like really strong uh, overpressed mint and myrrh and rhubarb and I think that that's working really really well right now. <laughs> the sweetness is gonna have to be addressed. I think it's a little too sweet but oh my god leave it to Fernet Branca. I think I've never tried before to fix a cocktail that for a while I thought was just gonna be dead dead on the cutting room floor. That 
is so, so tasty. Wow. <laughs> so what are my uh, closing thoughts on uh, Fernet Branca? Which I, I mean, I kind of skipped over looking at the bottle here, but to start, really great branding, really classic traditional styling of labeling left over from the 1840s. Um, it's, it's a robust and enjoyable liqueur um, in the Amaro family that honestly, I'm super thankful Al Roth that you uh, suggested this to me because I, I probably never would have bought a bottle of Fernet had somebody not said, hey, you should give it a shot. Not because that I, I didn't want to try it myself, but because it was kind of out of the way. And uh, my usual studies in mixology don't take me that you know, far into the world of Amari. So thank you. Honestly, this is a super, super versatile and interesting ingredient that is very potent, but enjoyable. And while it is definitely not to everyone's palate, I think anybody who's invested in mixology the way that I am should own a bottle of this, and I kind of hate myself for not buying one sooner. Because it just took a cocktail that I thought was going to be dead and made it something that I might be able to feasibly put together again. So, cheers to you, Fernet Bronco. That's awesome. <laughs> And so that is all that I have for you guys today. We're going to go ahead and go ahead and do a reading from our book, Crisp Toast. We are once again in the adventure section and our next toast from that section goes as such. As Mikey said in the Life Cereal commercials, try it, you'll like it. Cheers. Remarkably, once again, this book is remarkably apropos because Try it, you'll like it is exactly how I would describe Fernet Branca. Thank you all so much for watching this episode of Mike's Start Reviews. If you enjoyed it, click that like button down below and remember to subscribe to catch new episodes of the show that come out every single Friday and sometimes on Tuesdays. Uh, you can follow me on my socials that are either appearing on the screen now or have been on the screen for some time. I'm mostly on TikTok uh, after YouTube, but frankly, I'm really just here. So if you want to follow me here, you know where to find me. Have a great rest of your day. Please remember to drink responsibly and I will see you in the next episode. Cheers. <laughs>